Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to um, our Zoom workshop around um, bee-friendly plants. And I also want to touch on native bees today and, of course, the importance of pollination. Um, now, I'm hoping that Joanne has said it so I'm the main host here and all you can see is me. Um, if you can't, however, though, if you go into the top right-hand corner, you can change your gallery view um, of what you can see. So I'm going to go straight into the PowerPoint and then we'll come back later and we're going to play a game of bingo. Um, oh, and I'll show you some examples of um, different ways that we can help bees. So I'm just going to share my screen here. Go to my desktop. Press the right button, Carmel. Okay. And why does that always end up up the top there? Slide show, play from the start. Radio. I hope you can all see me there. If you can just make sure you've muted yourselves um, and we will get started. If you have any questions, just pop them in the chat and I'll try and get to them later. Or if I see them along the way, I'll have a look. So I want to talk about the, the importance of pollination and biodiversity. And I want to touch on our Australian bees versus the honeybee. Um, because the Australian bees are native and the honeybees are actually introduced species. Um, so, of course, when an introduced species um, swarms or gets out in the wild, like dogs or cats or foxes or rabbits, um, they actually become feral. So um, to have some understanding that the honeybee is not um, native to Australia, it's actually an introduced species. And I really think that our um, Australian native bees need more recognition and support um, so we can get some more knowledge out there. So some of you may already know this, um, and that's, oops, gone too far. And that uh, let's talk about what is the symbiotic relationship between the bees and the flowers. So the flowers um, give two types of food. They give nectar, which is an energy, and then some bees, like the honeybee, turn that into honey, um, and that's their carbohydrate. And then they give pollen, which is their protein, and they use that to build more bee bodies. And so um, that's often mixed with the nectar and given to the very young. Um, as I said, some of you may already know this. It's uh, pretty basic stuff, but if you don't, then um, hopefully you'll learn some technical terms. So the parts of the flower that we have are the petal, which is often quite attractive. I'm doing well this morning, aren't I? Um, the petal, and then inside the petal is uh, the stamen in the middle, or well, not always in the middle, but that has the seed fruit. So that's what's going to turn into the seed so that we can make more plants and then more seeds and then more fruit. And, and so the cycle goes on and that's how the plant itself reproduces. And then the pistils, they are what carry the pollen. And what needs to happen is the, um, the pollen needs to go from the pistil to the stamen and that fertilization or pollination process is what then creates the seed. So in order to get the pollinators or the bees to come and do that, the plant gives the animals a reward. And as well as the um, pollen, the reward is the protein, that sweet, sticky nectar um, that attracts the uh, bees and animals to the plant. So there are different types of flowers. There are perfect flowers and there are imperfect flowers. And as we're looking at here, this is an imperfect flower that needs help to get pollination. So on the left-hand side there, you're looking at, I believe this is going to be a pumpkin. And this is what we would call the female flower. So that has a fruiting body there ready to go. And that contains the stamen and also contains the nectar. And you can see down the bottom there, there's a few little ants are there feeding on the nectar. The next flower 
is the male flower and that contains the pistil on the inside which has the pollen if you look down the bottom you might see the pollen grains down there and so the pollen from that flower needs to get to the stamen from this flower now we can break those male flowers off and we can hand pollinate them ourselves, but that's um, a pretty painstaking job to go around and make sure that they're all pollinated. So this is where the pollinators come in and as they're feeding from one, they can fly to the other. So let's go through the pollination. You've got self-pollination where the one flower has both male and female and it can be pollinated by itself. And so grasses, for example, the wind can blow and the pollen will get distributed by the wind um, and they'll pollinate by themselves. Corn is another example. But like the pumpkin, um, sometimes you need the pollen from one flower to go across to the other flower. So um, pumpkins, watermelons, zucchinis, they're all um, very classic examples of that type of pollination. And then the final type is called cross-pollination, where the pollen from one plant has to go not to the same plant, but a completely different plant. And some examples like that are gooseberries, tamatillos, um, and the real classic, of course, is almond pollination. And not only do they need to go to a completely different plant, they have to go to a completely different species. So that's pretty amazing. And this is where the pollinators really come into their own. So why are pollinators so important? Well, this is basically what our world would look like without pollinators. And most of these plants here that you're looking at, they would be just wind pollination. So uh, life would get pretty boring and pretty bland. We would have a lot of carbohydrates, um, but not much of anything else, a little bit of protein. So pollinators are important because about one third of the food that we eat, obviously grains take up um, about two thirds of the volume that we eat, but about one third of the food that we eat um, needs some sort of pollination. And about 70% of those plants that need pollination are actually 100% reliable on bees or other pollinators. So without the insects um, and pollinators helping, then we wouldn't get things like fruit, some veggies, some legumes, a lot of our nuts, and even our livestock, believe it or not, um, because cows, for example, they can't eat just grass. Their stomachs can't handle it. And they need a variety of different types of plants to eat, clover and loosen being uh, big ones in their diet. And the clover is 100% needed um, for um, to reproduce itself. So the milk that you drink and the mints that you use in your spaghetti bolognese um, has actually come via the bees. So this... Um, strawberry demonstration, I think, really illustrates um, how intricate the pollination job can be. So for a strawberry flower to um, be nice and round and plump, if you have a look on the top left there, it's a beautiful looking strawberry. It's nice and even. It look, it's got no blemishes. It looks fantastic. That's because it was visited about 12 times by one or another insect for the fruit to be able to set evenly. So to the right of that, you can see a strawberry flower. And in the middle, all around the outside, they are, oops, I've done it again. They are all of the pistils where the pollen is. If you have a look down the bottom, you can see that. So that's all the pollen there. But in the middle, that's all of the stamens. So that pollen needs to be spread around across that whole area in order for the fruit to set. So down the bottom there, you can see a strawberry. It looks nice and plump on the other underside, but the top side is all misshapen. That would be because that flower um, would have been either only visited a few times or 
It wasn't visited at all. And that one was wind pollinated. So the wind has come beautifully from one side and it's pollinated about half of the flower, but the other half of the flower missed out on that even pollinization. And so the fruit itself has um, set unevenly. So if you've got strawberries at home and you notice any like this, now you'll know why that's happened like that. So we've got several types of pollinators. Um, we've got moths and butterflies, um, the hoverfly, which is an Australian native, um, bats like fruit bats, and there are some flowers that only come out at night time and the bats really help with that. And then obviously our honey eater birds, they help with the pollination as well. And then we've got our bees. Now the honey bees are really fantastic at it, but we do have Australian native bees and believe it or not, there are actually um, some flowers which are more suited to um, some of these native bees than to um, the honey bee. And I will demonstrate why as we go along. So here's three of our most popular ones in, here in Australia. And we, we actually get these down in the Southern States. So there you're looking at a leaf cutter bee, a blue banded bee and the home elictus bee, which are quite tiny. So there's a really, um, there's more websites coming around all the time, but there's a really good one called aussiebee.com.au if you want to look up um, more about Australian bees. And we've currently, they believe, um, we've got around 2,500 species of bees in Australia alone. And this list um, down below you shows you the 10 major groups of Australian native bees. And as you can see, there are some that we don't get here in Victoria, and that's mainly because it's too cold down here. So the stingless bee, which actually does make honey, it only makes about a kilo of honey a year. Um, they're up further north where it's a bit warmer, but we can't get them down south. Um, and the stingless bees, they also live in a colony together like a honeybee. Um, but most of the other bees, um, although they some they may live in a collective as such or like in a, a neighbouring suburb, so to speak, um, they don't, um, they are actually what we call solitary bees. And so there's no queen as such. All of the females are queens and they all do the work and they all lay their own children, which again, you'll see demonstrated soon. So let's talk about size of bees. Um, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Australia's largest bee is about 2.4 millimetres long. It's called the great carpenter bee. And so if you take your two thumbs and put them side by side at, so that your um, thumbnails join together, that is about the length from one edge of your thumbnail to the other edge of your thumbnail. That is about the length of a carpenter bee. And if you take your little finger and with your thumbnail, you divide the top of your little fingernail in half now divide that half in again. So you've got a quarter of your fingernail across. That is the length of Australia's smallest bee, which lives in the far north of Australia called the Quasi Hesma. So it's not even two millimetres long, it's tiny. The males are absolutely tiny. So it shows you the complete difference. Now, having a look at a European honeybee, if you just put your thumb out on its own and look across your thumbnail, that's about the length of a normal honeybee, um, a worker bee. The queen and the drones are a bit bigger than that. And then the homolictus bee, which you can see on my hand there, um, that's a, a just less than one centimetre long. And they come in... Um, shiny metallic blues and greens and blacks and and the one on my hand um, has a brown abdomen and I actually found that we were um, in a commercial kitchen extracting and um, that little bee had come in on one of the um, boxes so it was obviously attracted to the smell of the honey 
and there must have been some in the area where the other beekeeper had his hives. So as I said before, um, some bees are social bees and some bees are solitary bees. So our social bees, um, if we can compare the difference, on the left-hand side, you're looking at the Tetragonula and the Ostropeblibia, and they both live up north, and they are the stingless bees that create honey. And they, um, they don't need frames to grow on, so in the middle there, you are seeing the brood cluster. And to the outside, you see these, mm, you see these bubbles of honey. So the honey's more around the outside area. That photo in the middle, you are looking at the size comparison of a stingless bee and a honey bee, which is called Apis mellifera. So the stingless bees will create maybe a kilo of honey a year and the honey bee will create anywhere from 40 to 130 kilos a year. So you can see why the honey bee has been adopted for our honey production. They're very efficient at it. Um, as far as scientific research and recorded history goes, um, we only have recorded history of our native bees here in Australia for the past 22 years. So as far as records, as far as species and numbers go, um, this is a very new area of research. Whereas, you know, the honeybee, we've got records dating back um, for 8,000 years. And, you know, here in Australia, the honeybee has been here for 200 years. So we've got a whole lot more knowledge about the understandings and workings of the honeybee. As far as hives go, as far as uh, record keeping goes, as I said before, um, there are 5,500 hives in Queensland and New South Wales. And these are the honey, the uh, native honeybees that I'm talking about um, that live in colonies. Whereas in a just in Victoria, we've got 130,000 hives and 9,500 registered beekeepers. And they're the ones that we know about. This isn't counting the feral hives and the unregistered beekeepers out there. So again, as you can see, um, the European honeybee has a very strong hold here in Australia, but our native pollinators, we don't know what they can do. We, we re are only just finding out how important they are and the different skill sets that they have to our pollination, which is why biodiversity is so, so important. Um, someone said here, I understand that many native hives live in solo. However, I've read that it is possible to have a hive of native bees. Is this so? Also, which type of bees would native hives be and how would I go about attaining a hive? Yeah, so as I've mentioned, the stingless ones um, that live in a colony, they are only up in Queensland. So unfortunately, we can't have them here. What we can do is have insect hotels and we can promote um, gardens and environments um, that will promote the solitary bees. So I will go through that um, a bit later. As far as obtaining these native bees, um, besides creating an environment that they are attracted to because they are solitary bees, um, at this point, I don't know if there's enough or any, I don't, haven't even heard of any um, beekeepers that are encouraging the production of these solitary type of bees. Um, but as you'll see moving forward, we're going to watch a video. Um, there is a group that do, um, they use leaf cutter bees for pollination. So I think once you establish them, you would probably have to buy um, the larvae so they could hatch out and, and breed and populate for the next season. So again, there's just not enough research yet. So I would encourage if this is an area that interests you, um, get into it because it's, you know, there's, we want to know more. We really do want to know more of what's going on here. Now, down the bottom, the um, tetragonula travel between 300 and 500 metres 
versus the honeybee, which will travel between three kilometers to five kilometers. And this is to find food. So um, for example, the stingless bee is actually used to pollinate um, the, um, um, it's used to pollinate, um, I've had a blank, macadamia macadamia nuts it's used to pollinate macadamia nuts because they fit much better into the flowers and um if you're wanting if you've got a like a, a field for example so let's have a look let's put this into perspective all right here we go this um spot right in the middle there is iramu community center um, so, you know, most of you will know where Iramu Community Centre is. And so that red circle around the outside of that, that is 300 to 500 metres. So if you had a field of trees that you wanted to pollinate and you had your native bees, and again, not here in Victoria, but up north, let's say the macadamians, then the native bees are not going to fly very far. So you're going to get a good chance of the native bees feeding on where they are meant to pollinate. Whereas, as you can see, that blue circle, that represents five kilometres. So if you were to put honeybees in that field where your native pollinators are, and there's something in flower that's further away and the bee sense of smell is amazing, they can go further afield to go and get their food. So you don't have as much of a guarantee that the honeybee is going to stay in the area that you need it to pollinate. So this is where sometimes you have to flood the area with lots of hives so you can get the pollination. So let's break that down a bit so you can really in your mind. Um, so there we go, there's Iramu right in the center. So your native bees, the smaller ones, you know, they're gonna go up to the IGA or down to the BMX track, all right? That's a 500 meter radius there. Whereas the honeybees, you can see it doesn't, it, it disappears off the chart here. So, um, Manor Lakes Primary School is about four, three to four kilometres as far as the, if that was a bird or a bee flying straight there um, or office works. So the bees, a honeybee from Iramu Community Centre could potentially end up at office works or, you know, the Starbucks up on Heath Road. All right, when I, when I zoomed out further, it actually gets to Derrimut Road, Derrimut Road. So a honeybee can travel much, much further. So there's a, there's a whole lot more um, risk of it being attracted to other areas. So it just gives you an idea of the scope of what these insects are doing. So ways, the different ways that bees pollinate. Oh, here we go, here's the macadamians. So there's um, buzz pollination and our native blue banded bees, the teddy bear bees, the carpenter bees and the metallic carpenter bees. Um, they are the ideal pollinators of crops which require a special kind of pollination such as tomatoes, kiwi fruit, eggplants, blueberries, cranberries and chilli peppers. And so um, these bees are being encouraged for this kind of pollination. The commercial honeybee cannot perform buzz pollination. Um, and then to the right there, what you're seeing there is the macadamian flowers. So you can see down the bottom are those tiny little um, native bees that I was talking about, and they fit much better into the flower than the honeybee, which looks like a giant compared to those flowers. So they would, they have a, um, their tongue is only so long. So as far as crawling around and sipping the nectar and, and getting to the pollen, especially if the pollen is hidden away. So here I've got a video 
And the first, the best examples within the first 20 seconds or so. So it's quite quiet. So I'm going to stop talking. And if you want to just make sure you've got your volumes up so you can hear, but you will see how the bee literally shakes itself to shake the flower to spread the pollen around. So here we go. This is a blue banded bee. Now watch its wings. Did you see that? I'm gonna go forward a little bit more. So it's the blue banded bee. They've slow motioned it down, but you'll see how it shakes itself. Armagilla is the uh, scientific name for this bee. And not all of them have blue bands, by the way. They're quite furry at the front end and they have those stripes at the back. Watch this. See how it shakes itself? It's almost like a jackhammer. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. All right. We are going to go to the next slide. Now, this next one is also um, called trigger pollination. So the pollen is literally hidden inside the flower. And this is the leaf cutter bee, which um, they've managed to find a way to keep them in colonies. So this will partly answer the question of how can I keep the native bees? So this is an amazing video and I'm gonna let them explain it themselves. Okay, this bee seems confused. That leaf she's gnawing on is no flower. But this is an alfalfa leaf cutting bee. She needs hunks of leaves to build her nest. A lot of them. All this is her lacy handiwork. She hauls the pieces back home. Leaf cutters use them to line the inside of their nest. In nature, she might use a nook and cranny in a log. But here, her nest is in what's basically a bee apartment building, a high rise made of styrofoam. These markings help the bee find her way back to her personal condo. You know, like 7B. And furnishing it takes a while because see that pile? These are the pieces they dropped. The bees are here to work in this alfalfa field in California. They're from Europe originally but farmers here use them because they have a real knack for pollinating alfalfa flowers, which grow tiny seeds inside these curly pods. Farmers use the seeds to plant new fields of alfalfa, which is grown to make hay, to feed these gals. So really your glass of milk comes courtesy of these bees. But pollinating alfalfa flowers is a lot trickier than it looks. Even honeybees can't really hack it. Here's why. Alfalfa keeps its pollen locked away inside its flowers. To get it, the bees have to step on a spring-loaded petal called a keel petal. Here's how it works. Pop, it releases this column that has the pollen at the end. It's called tripping the flower. Here it is again. The column has some force. The bee might get a good thwack in the face. Leaf cutting bees just don't care. They can take a punch. Pop. Honey 
babies don't really like to tangle with that. They'll usually step around gingerly, trying to sip nectar from the side without setting it off. Leaf cutting bees get coated in pollen and bring it back home to their nest so they can pack it in there to feed their growing babies. Each one is bundled in a little leaf wrapped bassinet. Aw, there they are. The siblings all lined up together. A new generation of the toughest little bees around. Hi, it's Lauren. We want to do something extra special. Okay, who found that interesting? I hope you did. I always find it interesting when I watch it. So I hope that answers um, how you could maybe keep them for yourself. If you are creating a shelter where the bees can live, um, that's going to encourage those kind of um, insects into the area. And so you also saw with the um, honeybee that if they are not triggering that pollen to be released, then they're not going to be pollinating those alfalfa plants. So they're not going to get more seeds. And without the seeds, they can't plant more plants again. And so then that um, reproductive cycle or the pollination cycle stops. So let's go through some shelters. What, what can you do in your garden? Obviously, up the top, we've got a honeybee um, there, and there's a queen and a worker bee. So that's the queen there. Um, and, you know, that's specialised to have a hive. Um, you can become a beekeeper, but there are things that you can do. So having reeds in your garden is really important. And although the um, blue banded bees are solitary, the male bees, they tend to collect congregate together so the female lives in the ground she's a burrowing bee down the bottom there and the male bees they congregate and they'll hang out on reeds um, obviously plants that the leaf cutter likes to eat and then there are plants with a soft inner grasses and reeds and bamboos and that sort of thing um, where the bees can burrow into um, through those tubes to lay their babies and here you can see on the bottom left, there is um, some insect hotels. They've been made out of clay, or as you saw in that video, you can also make them out of polystyrene. So the hole that you put is probably no wider than a pencil, and it has to be at least about 12 centimetres long because they um, want to be able to go inside and be safe from predators and the weather and to put a few number of larvae in there. Um, insect friendly water is important. You don't want the insects to drown. And I know I've gone over this before, um, but there are several ways that you can create insect friendly water um, so that um, there's always a water supply. Don't put out honey for bees. Um, it's not good for them. And you don't necessarily have to put um, sugar water either. If you've got lots of plants that are flowering, they're going to get the nectar that way. So that's a much better way um, than putting sugar out into the environment. So just water. Water is an essential one that, you know, all living creatures need it. Um, and then, again, I've gone through this before, um, but, you know, don't put pesticides around. Leave the weeds for the bees. And um, the bees themselves, they they actually see things differently to what we do. Um, they see on what's called the ultraviolet spectrum. So colours to them are quite different for us and different plants um, actually attract them differently. So I'm just going to stop screen sharing for a minute and we've got a question there. Are leaf cutter bees Australian? Yes, they are. So there are... Uh, native leaf cutters to different countries around the world. And so, yes, we do have our own native leaf cutter bees here in Australia. Um, if you want to find out more about um, Australian native bees, um, this is, is this backwards? Damn, it's backwards. No, you can see it the right way. Oh, fantastic. Awesome. Excellent. So, um, this is, um, this is a creating a haven for native bees. 
and it is by a lady called Kit Prendergast. Now, Kit Prendergast runs a Facebook group called Bees in the Burbs, and she's a entomologist, and she's done her PhD um, in um, native bees. And this is a great little book. Um, it has all sorts of information in there. It has plants um, that the native bees are interested in, some really good how to build some good hotels because a lot of the commercial hotels are actually no good for the insects. The insects won't be interested in them. And she's right into the scientific names and stuff. So if you want to learn more, this is a great little book. Um, you can um, contact her directly through Bees in the Burbs or just Google her, Kit Prendergast. She's really easy to find. So um, if you want to learn more, that's a really good resource. Um, water, as I said before, this is um, this is a pet. You know, it didn't cost me much. I think I got it from a $2 shop. Um, what you would do is you would put your water in here. Then you would put the base on upside down. Then when you turn it the right way, um, as the water gets to here, so it'll fill up and then it'll stop and it creates a vacuum. And then what you can do is I've just gotten a collection of these uh, rocks and marbles. I'll just come down here so you can see them better. So these are rocks, rocks and marbles that you can put in there. And then that creates a safe place um, for the bees to land on. And the reason I chose the blue marbles is because, of course, um, bees are quite attracted to the colour blue because they see on the ultraviolet spectrum. So that, again, a really easy way to make a safe watering area for your bees. If you're wanting to make an insect hotel, um, now I've since learned these are probably too big for um, the blue banded bees. You're going to want something that's much smaller. So let me get out this one here. And that's a much better size. The measurements of the holes are actually in that book um, that I that I just showed you. Um, so that's you know that's more more the width of a pencil. Okay. So um, if you've got some bamboo growing at home, that's um, a great alternative. If not, you can make your own. There's a very easy one to do. You just put a nail in it and fill that up. And you want to fill it up so that nothing falls out. So you can stuff in twigs and stuff. These are um, paper straws that I bought. Um, you can buy bamboo straws now from Kmart. So these were um, bamboo straws from Kmart that I just cut up. Um, you can get bamboo from Bunnings as well. Just make sure it's not treated. Um, the other thing you can do is these are paper straws that I made. And again, I just had some paper and I simply rolled it around a pencil and glued it. And so that's another easy way to, now just make sure that this one was done on an angle. So you wanna make sure that there's, see how they sit, they don't stick out. They sit inside the tin. So that is gonna create some weather away from the rain so that the bees don't get wet. Um, if you don't have tins, you can always use a, um, this is also gonna be weatherproof, a plastic bottle. And again, you would just shove them in there until you've got so many that they are insecure, uh, that they are insecurely and they don't fall out. And the reason why I like these is um, after a while, if ever any get um, invaded by spiders or they get old and mouldy for pests and disease management, you can take these out and replace them with new ones. So for health and hygiene, having replaceable sticks is a really, really good idea. Um, now, as far as plants go, I've got some here and then we're going to play bee bingo and you'll learn some more. So um, sunflowers are obviously, um, they, they love them. There's different sunflowers. You can buy the bee and butterfly mixes um, and you've actually got some of this in your, 
where's my seed packet gone? You should have all received one of these. And if you haven't, um, go and collect it from Iramu um, when you can or when, when the next collection um, day is available. So in here, you've got a combination of this one, the bee and butterfly mix, and also um, the beneficial insect mix. And as a bonus, I mixed it with, you can also buy, and I got all of these at Bunnings, by the way, but there's also other nurseries around, um, the bee friendly flower mix. Now this one has, um, what's the ingredient? Vermiculite, it has vermiculite in it. Now vermiculite is, um, it comes from a stone that they've actually heated up and it ends up becoming all fluffy. So it's a natural mineral and it actually helps to hold water. So what I took is I took one of these boxes and I added a couple of packets of these. And this has also got um, a whole lot of seeds in it. So you can look these up on Bunnings or it should be on the handout that you received as well. And so I, I just wanted to boost the number of seeds that you had in the little packet that you got. So I've given you a good bonus. Um, you've got things like buckwheat and coriander and dill, marigolds, caraway. Um, this has all the botanical names, um, but also, you know, other marigolds and other things like that. Um, some of them are repeated, but some of them are not. This one had lavender in it, borage, calendula, native violet, sage, Swan River Daisy. So there's even, sounds like there's some Australian natives in there. So this little packet that I've given you um, has a good mix of things that are going to attract um, bees. And what you can do, because it's got the vermiculite in it, is you can, it'll be easier for you to shake it around. So you can get a really nice spread and do quite a big area of the seeds. Um, or, you know, I gave you other examples. If you want to buy a packet of seeds, there's um, seed paper that you can make. So if you've got a party coming up or an event or a wedding and you wanted to give up out a, a nice little bombonieri, you could make, you know, some seed paper hearts for people. Um, or you can make seed bombs. So there's, there's so many ways. I just wanted to give you some creative ideas as to what you could do with the seeds to um, promote that. So Lucen's another one. Lavender, of course. Bergamot. Borage. Um, clove, you can get red and white clove. Now, these are sprouts for us to eat, but if you let them grow and grow and go to flower, you will um, then attract, and you can throw these in your lawn as well, um, and then you can collect the seeds and grow them again or they'll be self-seeding. Um, that one was in your mix, and the other one is also there's an Australian native flower mix that you can get. So there's so many out there. Um, a really good book is by Doug Purdy. He has brought out a great book and that should be on your handout um, as far as what kind of plants um, are good for the garden. And there's perennials, annuals, there's flowers, there's bushes, there's trees. Um, obviously in Australia, we've got our gum trees and that's why the honeybees have done so well um, because they really, really, really love our gum trees. So um, they're kind of almost like, I don't know, you know, they've, they've become Australian citizens, so to speak. They've been here that long. Um, so, yeah, look, that's it for the talk so far. But I reckon we play a game of bingo and learn a bit more about some more plants. And so for the winner today, I recently, these aren't even on my website yet. So, um these are some blue banded bee material. I've got a light blue, I've got a medium blue, and I've got a bone colored, and they've all got this blue banded bee on it. I think it's just as cute as, they're not even on my website. And what I'm gonna offer for the winner today is um, a set of two beeswax wraps. 
made out of whatever color you would prefer. So um, once we know who the winner is, please let me know whether you would like the light blue, the medium blue, or the bone colored or fawn colored. Um, and I will make you especially a set of beeswax wraps um, with the blue band of bee on it. So um, I'm gonna share the screen again. Oh, before we do, any questions? Questions or comments? No, no questions. All right, let's play bingo. Have you all got your piece of paper ready? Get yourselves organized while I sort out my screen here. Right, here we go. And from the start. So did any of you at the start of the year see this? on the news. So there, in March of this year, 2021, there was a Woolworth store in Sydney and they actually took away um, foods and showed what a future would look like without bees, which I thought was pretty amazing. So I thought I'd show you that. Um, hold on, we've got a comment here. Where's my mouse gone? Do, do, do. Oh, here we go. My mouse has disappeared. Oh my goodness. Chat. Ah, oh, I'm glad you enjoyed the session. <laughs> All right, let's go up to my mouse is being really weird. Come on. Yeah, there. No, there we go. Wow. That was so strange. Okay. So, yes, this is what it looked like without food. Here we go. Look at that. It's amazing. It just feels so empty, doesn't it? So I thought that was just such a great visual. And this is why we need to promote biodiversity because the honeybees, although they're doing a great job, they haven't got everything covered. And, you know, like tomatoes and other plants like that, there are other bees that can help us. So we're going to play bee bingo. Again, if you can just rule up your paper, you don't have to put one to five. Um, just put five squares across and five squares down if you can draw up your sheet. And we are going to put, and what you'll do is you'll end up with a list of different plants at the end of this that you can put in your garden. So that's a bonus. All right, are we all ready to go? Yep, the grid for bingo is five by five squares. Absolutely. All right, anyone not ready yet? And again, you have to write bingo into the chat area, okay? All right, the first word is nectar. Please don't put that in the top left corner. Put it somewhere randomly around your chart. Nectar is the first word. And that's the sweet, sticky stuff that gives bees their energy. The next word in some other random square, you're going to put pollen. Pollen is the next word. And that is the bee's protein that helps to build more babies. The next word is borage. Borage is a really popular one with the bees. They love it. Gives a lot of nectar, actually. And it's that classic bluey purple color that they're quite attracted to. Borage. The next word you're going to write is sunflower. And there are mini ones and tall ones and red ones and orange ones and yellow ones. And of course, you get the seeds as well, which is a bonus. Sunflower. The next word you're going to write is lavender. I've never had lavender honey. So there's lavender honey that people put essential oil into, but there's lavender honey. So at the lavender farms, you can get lavender honey, and I've never tasted it yet. I'm quite interested in, in tasting it one day. Lavender. Now, believe it or not, ivy. And what you're looking at in the top left-hand corner there, this is in 
Mount Gambia. I went to Mount Gambia and there's sinkholes all around that area because it's limestone country. And that is a massive big sinkhole and you can actually walk all the way down to the bottom and there's beautiful gardens down there. If you ever get a chance, it's amazing because um, at night time there's possums that live in the caves and you're actually allowed to feed the possums as long as it's fruit. So watermelon, carrot, apple, um, there's signs everywhere, but the possums will come out and you can feed them by hand. But in the daytime, there's these beautiful gardens and draping all the way down the side is this ivy. Like it's the longest ivy I've ever seen in my life. It, that's about uh, three or four stories tall from the bottom to the top of this sinkhole. It's just incredible. And when I was there, I counted about seven or eight beehives. Um, and they're honeybees. So, yes, they are feral hives that are there. Um, but they live there in this sinkhole under the cave wall and they're just hanging there because it's all dry and protected where they are. And this was a photo that I took. And the, this ivy happened to be in flower when I was there. And it was buzzing with bees. They were everywhere and they weren't interested in me. They, I felt quite safe and they were feeding off of the ivy. So um, I, I was just amazed by that experience. Okay, the next word you're going to put there is poppy. Now, poppies are a good one to grow during winter time, actually. Um, so they can be a good food source for the bees in winter time. My mouse is being weird today. Right, the next word is grevillea. Now, what you're looking at there is a silky oak grevillea, which is in a tree form. Grevillea is a native, Australian native, but it comes in many different forms and many different colours. So you can have it quite small as a bush. And it can be pink and red and yellow and um, white <coughs> and obviously orange. And they flower, well, the silky oak in particular, um, that flowers around November, at the beginning of November. Oregano, so any of those flowering herbs um, the bees quite like. Oregano is a good one. Oregano, if you can write that in a square somewhere. The next word you're going to write is sugar gum. Sugar gums are quite often on, um, farmers use them as windbreaks. Um, I have seen them planted as street trees that the council have put there. And the sugar gums are good because they flower every single year. And obviously, as far as gum trees go, you've got yellow box and uh, red box and like there's all sorts. And um, when I do my honey tasting one on, on Saturday, I'll go more into the different um, varieties of honey that we get. Cherry plum. So it's an ornamental um, and again, councils in especially some of the older areas, um, more these days around Wyndham, they're putting in Australian natives, which is fantastic. But um, there are still areas where you will find a lot of cherry plums um, as street trees. So that, again, a really good food source at the start of spring for the bees. Bottle brush. Now, the bonus with bottle brush is they flower twice a year. So the bottle brush is just starting to flower now and then you'll get another flush um, just at the beginning of autumn as well. And again, they come in different, uh, different colours. Bottle brush, hope you've written that word down somewhere. The next word, now any of our brassicas. So canola, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, um, all kale, they are all part of the brassica family. So bok cho pak choy. So if you want to let them go to flower, um, the bees, any kind of bees, I've even here at home, I've got a lot of wild canola growing because the farmer across the road still grows canola. And I've seen the homolictus bees on the canola flowers. So um, they are good for um, any kind of bees. Jacaranda. Now, jacaranda is an interesting one. Um, that flowers around December, Christmas time. And please be very careful if you're walking under a jacaranda tree when it's in flower, 
because the nectar from the flowers actually stays in the flower for a few days after it's fallen on the ground. And there are, you will find bees sipping the nectar from inside the flowers that have fallen on the ground. So there is a highly, a big chance that if you're walking under a jacaranda tree, you could very well be squashing some bees. So you're putting the bees' lives in danger and you also um, might get stung by a bee that is feeling annoyed by you stepping on its lunchtime. So um, that's one of the special features about jacaranda. They give lots of nectar. Marigolds, a classic one for the bees, marigolds. And uh, calendula is a type of marigold. And uh, marigold flowers are edible as well for us too. They're nice in salads. So marigolds are a good one for the bees. Pop that in a square somewhere. The next word you're going to write down is carpet weed. Now this is a weed and they are tiny, eeny weeny little flowers that come out around December, January. Um, they give quite a dark tasting honey. And again, I'll go into that when I have my um, honey tasting workshop on Saturday. Um, it is a weed and very common around our area, um, especially on the old farmlands. Another one that's already up and about this time of year is the oxalis or sour sops as I used to call them. I don't know about you, but we used to chew on the stems as a kid. Um, again, a really important um, nectar source and also some pollen for the bees this time of year. So coming out of winter, um, especially if they're short of food, these um, oxalis are an important food source for them, uh, very handy. So I know we think of them as weeds, but um, the bees love them. The next word you're going to write in a square is, believe it or not, geraniums. Geraniums can be quite popular and there's so many different flavours of geraniums. Did you know that you could get coconut and apricot and apple nutmeg and rose mint and gooseberry peach and atta of rose and I've seen it, I've got a chocolate one. There are all these different types of geraniums. They're amazing. And if you take the leaves and rub them, you get all these different smells. Absolutely incredible. And, um, yeah, the bees quite enjoy them, the geraniums, believe it or not. The next word you're going to write is a psyllum. And this is great for even along the footpath on the front of your um, fencing. It's a very little plant and it will, it will just keep growing and self-seed and um, turn into a nice little hedge or edging. So the asylums are a really good one for that. Another one is wattle. Now, not all wattles um, give anything to the bees, but some of them give really good pollen. So again, coming out of winter when the queen is wanting to start laying again and build up that population, they want protein for their babies. So the pollen coming from the wattle um, is a good one at the start of spring. Now, you might have seen these around our streets here in Werribee and Wyndham um, in Western Victoria here is the iron bark, which has a very dark um, bark. And it has red flowers, but it also has white flowers. So they are, again, a really important one coming out of winter um, at the start of spring is the iron bark. Now, not to be confused with a tea tree is the melaleuca, which is the paper bark. And that comes out around Christmas time. And the bees absolutely love it. So that's the paper bark tree or the melaleuca, which um, a lot of people confuse for tea trees. So melaleuca, if you can write that in a square somewhere. And clover, the red and white clover. I'm looking over a four-leaf clover. The what? Sorry. So clover is, and I think that might be, have you got all your squares filled up? Oh, no, we've got a few more to go. Cape weed. Now, Kate, again, a pain in the bum weed. 
that a lot of people don't like. As a beekeeper, when we see the cape weed, then we know that swarming season is about to start. The pollen in the cape weed is incredible and the hives really take off. So for beekeeper, for honeybee beekeepers, um, cape weed for us is a major trigger that um, swarming season is going to take off in a really big way. And the last one is Patterson's Curse, which again is a noxious weed, another one that we don't like. Um, but the bees love it. It has really, really good nectar for them. Now, there was rumours going around that the honey from Patterson's Curse is poisonous. Well, if you were to eat about 10 kilos of honey, then the toxin in the Patterson's Curse honey, it would have an effect on you, but you're not going to eat 10 kilos of honey in one sitting. So um, most Patterson's Curse honey gets blended with other honeys and if it's around I mean there's not a you know it's getting eradicated so there's not as much of it these days um, but yes it can be toxic but you would have to eat a hell of a lot of honey before it had any effect on you so um, that rumor that it is a, um, a honey you can't eat is not true because um, it normally gets blended um, with other honeys. So that's the end of our, I hope you've all got, have you all got the squares? Excellent. We haven't missed any. All right. So in the chat, be ready to write bingo. Here we go. We're going to start crossing them off. The first one we're going to cross off is a psyllum, that little hedge one. The, uh, sorry, alyssum. Alyssum. It helps if I pronounce them correctly, doesn't it? Spelling in English was not my strong point when I was at primary school. Right, the next word is borage. Borage, those bluey purple flowers that the bees love. Borage. Let's go for another purple flower and we're going to go up to the jacaranda tree now. Jacaranda. While we're talking about trees, how about we cross off and iron bark, iron bark. Let me know if I'm going too fast for you. And another tree, sugar gum, sugar gum. The sugar is sweet and the sour one is the oxalis, oxalis. Sticking with our yellow flowers, how about we cross off the cape weed? Let's cross off the cape weed. And speaking of weeds, we're also going to cross off carpet weed. Carpet weed. The next one you're going to cross off is nectar. Nectar. And let's do its partner, the nectar and the pollen. Let's cross off pollen. Speaking of the letter P, how about poppy? Poppy. And the next word to cross off will be cherry plum. Cherry plum. Oh, has someone gotten bingo? Hey, who got bingo? Joanne's iPhone. Excellent. We got bingo. Thanks, Joanne. Well done. Congratulations. Now, Joanne, I need you to tell me which one do you want? Do you want the light blue, the medium blue, or the bone colored? And they've all got this really cute blue band of B on it.
you have the medium blue done all right so give me a week or two and i will get them out to you so we've got joanne and we've got the blue medium excellent well there we go we have learned about pollination i hope i've inspired you to get out to your garden you've got all of these different plants um so thank you for playing i hope you enjoyed it are there any last questions before i get going no wonderful all right well happy gardening people happy creating a place for all of our native bees and little insects and pollinators so that they can be happy little vegemites and uh, because you know this pollination it's our food security right without these pollinators we don't have the food that we need so um, we can all do our bit to help promote that so thanks for your time today everyone <laughs>